Today, I want to start out with just a little bit of a confession. One of my greatest weaknesses, one of my secret temptations that I struggle with every single day is the candy aisle. Every time I run to the grocery store to, to grab that one thing that we forgot, it calls to me, right? For me, it's the Kit Kat bars. Anybody have their favorite candy, right? For me, it's those delicious. Sometimes I'm feeling the gummy candies, and maybe I'll splurge on a Reese's from time to time. But for most of the time, it's the Kit Kat bars. And I love, they have different flavors now, right? There's regular, but then there's like mint and dark chocolate. Oh, it's so good. So good. But here's the problem. I'll be at work. And Sarah will text me, my, my wife Sarah, she'll text me and say, hey, can you grab, like, whatever, on your way home, like, maybe we need butter or milk or a spice for dinner, and she'll say, can you grab some, so I'm driving home, and I'll stop off wherever's convenient, maybe it's Meyer or Aldi or, or Family Fair, even, you know, they all have candy aisles, right? And so I get there, but here's the thing, I know, I, I'm an adult, I know you're not supposed to eat candy for dinner, and so I don't want her to find out. So, so I eat that candy on the way home, so she doesn't know. Now, let me ask you the selfish question. Have you ever eaten something in your car so your family doesn't find out that you have it? And now I know who's telling the truth, right? Like, <laughs> it's a peak dad move, right? It's terrible. If there's this little cubby in the door, you know what I'm talking about? Like the little place, that's where all the candy wrappers go, right? That's my stash of secret shame. But here's the problem. She catches me every single time, right? She always catches me, and you know how? First, I'm terrible at deceiving my wife, and I honestly, I don't want to get better at it. But number two, I'm not as hungry at dinner, right? I'm going home, and I just ate a whole Kit Kat thing, and I'm, I'm not as hungry. Like, usually, when I'm coming home from work, if I time it right, I get home, like, right at dinner time, and I'm a hungry, grown boy, Right, I can put away a big dinner. And you know that old dieting advice where it's like you eat, uh, what is it, breakfast is a king, lunch is a prince, dinner is a pauper, right? Like that's what you're supposed to do. Well, I get it a little mixed up. I eat breakfast like a king and lunch like an elephant and dinner like a two-ton whale, right? Like this is, this is how I eat my, right? I eat a good dinner, except when my tummy is all full of delicious Kit Kat, <laughs> right? I'm full. I'm not going to eat as much. And it shows. She knows, right? I, I, like, I have this delicious, healthy meal with my family sitting in front of me, and I'm all full of candy. You ever hear that phrase, you are what you eat from your head to your feet, right? I come home those days, I'm like 10% Kit Kat, right? Today, we are continuing our series, uh, our summer series, Moving Through the Beatitudes. If you want to open up in your Bibles, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 5. And if you want to look it up ahead of time, we're going to move back to Amos chapter 8 a little, in a little bit. Now, as we've been discussing, Matthew chapter 5 is this list of blessings, but they're not normal blessings, right? When we think of blessings, we think about good things like, congratulations, you graduated, or, or uh, you know, you got a new car, or you're having a baby. What a blessing. But what we've seen over the past couple of weeks is that the Beatitudes, they feel like backwards blessing. Jesus is emphasizing all the wrong stuff. He says, blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who mourn. And, and what we've found, if you scratch under the surface a little bit, and I'm going to give you the big teaching right now, what we have found is that it's not actually Jesus who is upside down. Jesus is not actually backwards. But through these teachings, Jesus is flipping us right side up. We are the ones who are backwards. These teachings, it's not just a list of like, good for you. These blessings are how the, it's the key to living the life that God calls us to live. And so I want to dive into verse 6, Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. And it says, God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. Now, let me ask you an obvious question. What do you hunger and thirst for. Now, I'm not talking about Kit Kat bars anymore, all right? This has nothing to do with tummy rumbles. This is about the longing of your heart. In our lives, all of us have a deep inner desire for something. Do you hunger for recognition, for attention, or fame? Do you, do you hunger for wealth, or even forget wealth, just financial stability? Do you hunger for attention, for love, for affection? Do you hunger for a, you know, a more vacation time or a better vacation, right? Or maybe it's just rest or just, do 
you just wish you weren't so tired and beat up all the time? What do you hunger for in your life? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice. And actually, in my Bible, the one I'm using, this is a New Living Translation, but when you go through, I have this little asterisk right next to the word justice. It says justice, but it's got a little note. And then, you know, um, down at the bottom, you know, it has a little footnote. And it says, it, when that happens, if you ever see that in your Bible, the footnote usually will give you, like, in the original text in the Greek, it means that there's multiple meanings. There's another word that it could be. And so I look down in my notes at the bottom, and it says, chapter 5, verse 6, it says, the word could be for righteousness. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And it got me curious because I was like, well, which is it? What is it? And so I went and did some, some research into the Greek. Now, the word in the Greek is, uh, we're going to try this, dikausune. I, I, that's the word, right? That's the word, dikausune. And it's true. It translates both ways as justice and righteousness. And actually, this happens all the time in the Bible. Some people get mad, and they try to pit one translation against the other as if they were disagreeing. They're like, no, my translation is better. And it's like, no, no, no. What is actually happening is that we are being invited into a deeper level of understanding. We do this in English all the time without even realizing it. I have done it already in this message. I use the word hungry, right? And when I say I'm hungry for Kit Kat bars, that means because I want to eat them, right? But when I say I am hungry for attention, I do not want to eat attention, right? We flip the, we do it all the time in our native language. And so in the Greek, that's, that's what they're doing. There's a, a depth of understanding. So if you ever have a friend or an internet troll or just someone who is attacking the Bible and saying, well, the Bible's inconsistent, there's different definitions, you can actually respond and say, no, 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 no. This helps us dive deeper and better understand what they mean in the original language. So to help us understand both parts of dikausunen, I want to use the example of the cross. Right? So righteousness is all about our status with God. It is the vertical relationship, right? Love of God. And that is something that we cannot earn, right? There's nothing that we can do. It's never going to be my good deeds. My relationship with God depends completely on his action. We know this. Jesus came to the earth, died a sinner's death on the cross for my sake. He took my sin so that I have been washed clean. And he has done that for all of us. I can never earn my way to heaven, but Jesus has done it for me. With Jesus, I can stand in front of God at the end of all things. He has given me righteousness. That's the vertical relationship with God, right? And it's a complete gift. Actually, a while back, there was a pastor named Alistair Beggs, and uh, I think he pastors a church in, like, Ohio, but he has a thick Scottish accent, and so he's a lot of fun to listen to if you want to go look up Alistair Beggs. He's really cool. Um, but he, uh, anyways, he tells a story about the thief on the cross, and if you're not familiar, when Jesus died, there were three crosses, right? He was on the middle cross, and there was a guy on the left and the right, and one of them was a thief. And, and one of the guys, uh, like, made fun of him, was mocking him, and the other one defended him and asked Jesus for forgiveness. He said, will you forgive me? And, the man, and Jesus responded to that man, and he said, today you will be with me in paradise. And Alistair says he has this whole bit. It's wonderful. He says, I can't wait until I get to go to heaven so I can find that fellow and ask him, how did that shake out for you? Because in one moment, you're, you're cussing the guy out with your friends. You've never been to a Bible study. You never got baptized. You, you don't know a thing about church membership, and yet you made it. You made it. How did you make it? I mean, that's what the angel must have said at the pearly gates, right? This thief on the cross, he just shows up, and he's like, what are you doing here? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? And he's like, well, I don't know. And the angel's just looking at him like, uh, let me go get my supervisor. And the angel goes, get the supervisor angel. And the supervisor angel comes over and he says, look, son, we've just got a few questions of you before we let you in, right? And it's like, well, are you clear on the doctrine of the justification by faith? Never heard of it. Okay, well, are you, are you clear on the, the doctrine of the Bible, the inerrancy of Scripture? Nope. And eventually, in frustration, the supervisor angel would say, on what basis are you here? 
And the thief on the cross would say, the man on the middle cross said, I can come. This is righteousness that comes from God. I can't earn it. The only way I can stand in front of God is because Jesus said, I can come. So hunger, to hunger after righteousness is to long for that, to long for God to wash you clean. If you have sin in your life, we long for something to wash us clean, something to take this burden away so that we can stand in freedom. I long for righteousness. I want to have that relationship with God where I finally feel complete. I finally feel fully satisfied in this life and in the next. I hunger and I thirst for righteousness, that vertical relationship. Now, justice, that's the horizontal bar of the cross. That is our love for the people around us, our love for neighbor. When God talks about justice, he's talking about caring for the poor, the lowly, the hungry, the naked, and the sick. He's talking about accountability and fairness. You ever hear that line in the song, God, break my heart for what breaks yours? Right? That's what this is. That's hungering for justice because our God is a God who raises up the oppressed, who releases the captive, brings sight to the blind, blind, throws down oppressors. When we say hunger for justice, what we're saying is that, God, I want to be on your side. I want to I love and care for the world the way you love and care for the world around me. Now, to show you what I mean, we're going to dive back into the book of Amos. Now, I don't have time to get into it really this morning, but Amos is an amazing book. The, it's an old te- he was a prophet in the Old Testament, and I think a lot of people skip over these books because they don't know how to read them. They're hard to understand, but we are missing out because the Old Testament prophets, these are some sassy boys, right? And they, they, they have such amazing stuff to teach us about justice, and they're just, um, it's like the best books about justice. So to make a very long story short, in the Old Testament, the country of Israel, they were uh, in the habit of getting comfortable. When they would prosper, they would get real comfortable as a society, and then they would get worse and worse and worse at loving their neighbor. They just stopped caring about other people. And so to, um, and, and God, that would tick God off because God has a heart for the lowly, for the humble, for the downtrodden, for the stranger. And so God, he, he would send these prophets and he would warn his people. He would send these prophets and say, hey, hunger and thirst for justice. Start loving people or I'm going to squish you like a bug. That's pretty much what he would say. Listen to this in chapter 8 of Amos, verse 1. It says, Then the sovereign Lord showed me another vision, and in it I saw a basket filled with ripe fruit. What do you see, Amos? He asked. And I replied, A basket full of ripe fruit. (laughs) Then the Lord said, Like this fruit, Israel is ripe for punishment. I will not delay their punishment again. So that's cheerful. And then verse 4, it says, Listen to this. You who rob the poor and trample down the leading, needy. You can't wait for Sabbath day to be over and the religious festivals to end so you can get back to cheating the helpless. You measure out grain with dishonest measures. You cheat the buyer with dishonest scales. And you mix the grain that you sell with the chaff swept up from the floor. And then you enslave poor people for one piece of silver or a pair of sandals. Now, I'm not going to get into some of the more colorful language, but just trust me when I say God is really mad at Israel for treating the poor poorly. And and this is so important because this passage gives us a little window into the character of our God. We worship a God who lifts up the lowly, who fights for those who are beaten down by the world. We are getting a glimpse into God's heart. This is who God is, and this is what he desires for the world. He wants us to hunger for justice, to love our neighbor in practical ways. And it all comes together in verse 11. Amos chapter 8, verse 11. This is my favorite. The time is surely coming, says the Sovereign Lord, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread or water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. This was written thousands of years ago for a tiny little country on the other side of the world. But couldn't it have been written for us here today in Byron Center, you know, Michigan? Can we relate 
to living in a country that is experiencing a famine of hearing the words of the Lord? Jesus says God blesses those who hunger and thirst for dikausunen, which is justice, for righteousness. Now, you might be tempted to say, well, which one? Which one does he mean? Is it righteousness or justice? And the answer is yes. It's a silly question. That would be like me asking my children, well, what do you want from me? Do you want me to love you in my heart on the inside, or do you want me to love you on the outside with my actions, like providing food and shelter and hugs and stuff? Which one do you want, kid? It's a silly question. They're, they're two sides of the same coin. We love God and we love our neighbor, right? That's the sign of the cross. We hunger and thirst for justice and for righteousness. Now, the last thing I want to show you from God's word is the end of the sentence. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. There is a deep truth here that only God can fully satisfy us. When we think about hunger, and not just for food, but in all things, hunger is a drive to fill the void that is inside of us. There is a longing in our lives for us to be deeply filled C.S. Lewis put it like this. He said, If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. We spend so much of our lives chasing the things that we think will fill the void inside of us, but the answer has been right in front of us all along. The only thing that can truly satisfy you as someone who's created by God and is loved by God, the only thing that can satisfy you is the love of God, your creator. This is actually a throwback to the same message from a couple weeks ago. When we talked about mourning, we said, blessed are those who mourn because they will be comforted. Blessed are those who hunger because they will be satisfied. The blessing is not the part where we are incomplete. The blessing is the fact that for those of us who live with Jesus Christ in our hearts, wholeness is coming. I was just talking about this with a friend this past week. Over the years, religion has given different things to different people. For some people, it gives a social structure, right? For some people, it gives an ethical code. For some people, it gives a a place to volunteer and do some good in the world. But the thing is, you can get all that stuff in other places now. Right, you can get your ethical codes from the law or social. You can get social structures from sports or school. You can volunteer all over the place. But what we are finding is that none of that stuff is enough. They talk about this newest generation, Gen Z and Gen Alpha. They are really struggling with a crisis of meaning. It's, this is what they talk about. They, just, they do all the things they used to do, but they have a crisis of meaning. And what we are finding in the church is people are still coming to church, searching for the one thing that is missing from every other place, and that is Jesus. We are incomplete without our creator. And if we hunger and thirst for God, we will be blessed because we will find him, and he will fill us and satisfy us like nothing else in this world can do. There's a a paraphrase of the Bible. It's a translation called The Message. Anybody know The Message from Eugene Peterson? It's nice. It's nice. And he puts it like this. He says, you are blessed when you have worked up a good appetite for God. His food and drink is the best meal you'll ever eat. It's not just about loving God and loving your neighbor, but it's also about the fact that those things, if you do them, they will bring you satisfaction that you cannot get from anywhere else in this world. Blessed are you, for you will be satisfied. You will be whole. You will be complete. And so that's the good news that I have for you today. If you hunger and thirst for God, you will be satisfied. And it's such amazing good news because sometimes I look at the world around us and I see so much hunger. I see a lack of justice. I see a lack of righteousness. And it's so heartbreaking that the world is even like this. Sometimes it can really beat me up. But Jesus is teaching us. He's like, that's good. It's good for you to feel that way. You should not be content with a world that has a lack of justice and a lack of righteousness. You should be bothered by it. You should be bothered and hunger for a better world. He tells us, if this is where your heart is at, If you are longing for righteousness, if you are longing for justice, you will be blessed because guess what? God is coming to fill us up, to set all wrongs right, to lift up the lowly and bring down the oppressor. But here's the problem. 
I think a lot of us try to satisfy that hunger with other solutions. We feel the void, that emptiness, that dissatisfaction, and we try to distract ourselves with other solutions. Instead, you know, it's like, it's like eating Kit Kat bars on the car ride home instead of the healthy meal with your family. So let me ask you this key question. Are you dieting on distraction or are you hungry for holiness? I think about Byron Center. This town might not have people starving in the streets. They might not have people walking 10 miles to get to their water like they do in some places. But we have our own type of hunger and thirst, don't we? And if not you personally, maybe it's someone you know, a neighbor, a friend, a coworker, family member. Byron Center has this cultural element where we can make things look good on the outside, but in the inside, we're kind of falling apart. I mean, how many of us are living lives that are just a brave face slapped on chaos? Are you or someone you know feeling like an empty shell? Because if you're feeling that way, I have great news about a God who can fully satisfy you. The emptiness we feel, it's not forever. It's not the way we are designed to be. And there is a God who will fill us up, who will heal every brokenness. And so my challenge to you today is one thing with two parts. Number one, the, the thing is I want you to stay hungry for the cross. Because the cross is both righteousness and justice. It's both the vertical and the horizontal. It's love of God and love of neighbor. So stay hungry for that love. Now, that's one thing with two parts, right? Part one, if you want to stay hungry for the cross, you've got to turn to God for satisfaction. This is the spiritual side, the vertical relationship. Some of us, we look for acceptance. And we look for something to fill that void we feel inside in all the wrong places. Some of us try to get accepted because of our good looks. You know, you think, oh, this is what will make people accept me. For some of us, it's our money or because of our job. Some of us have really bubbly personalities. We try to get people to accept us for that or because of our volunteering or our religious efforts. But if you're hungry for those things, you're just dieting on distraction. It's like candy before dinner. It might taste delicious, but it's not going to fill you. You're just getting, it's actually getting in the way of what your soul really needs. So maybe in order to focus on God, you have to turn to God alone for satisfaction. You may need to strip away some of the other things that you're trying to fill yourself with. Sometimes you got to throw away the junk food if you're ever going to get around to eating the stuff that will actually help you grow. So ask yourself, and seriously, take a moment of self-reflection this week. Ask yourself, what are you using in your life to feel filled? Is it a certain vacation? Is it, a, is it praise in the workplace? Recognition or fame? Or maybe you're just filling every moment with just distractions of social media and, and streaming. What are you using to feel filled that just isn't working? If you want to stay hungry for the cross, the first part is to turn to God and God alone for your satisfaction. Part two, stay hungry for justice. As some of you know, I live up in Grand Rapids. I live up just, just north of Alger Heights. And I would say my house, I live kind of on the edge of the nice stuff, right? Like if you drive in one direction, it gets really nice. But if you drive in the other direction, it can get in kind of the rougher parts of town. So every day when I'm driving home, I see panhandlers. You know what I'm talking about? The people on the corners with the cardboard signs. And they write, you know, what they need. I need money for this. I need money for that. Uh, food, hungry, whatever. And it breaks my heart every single time. Like, I'm a pastor. Pastors don't make that much money. I've never really cared about being wealthy, except in those moments where I wish I had more that I could give. I wish there was more that I could do. But it's kind of different around here in Byron Center. You know, I, I think in some places, hunger and need is so obvious. I mean, they're standing, holding a sign, telling you what they need. But in some other communities, it's not as obvious. But I can guarantee the hunger is still there. So here's what I want you to do this week to help you stay hungry for justice. I want you to look at your community. Look at the people you interact with in your life and ask yourself this question. What are they starving for? What is their poverty of the soul? The people around you, what do they need? Maybe people aren't standing on the corner holding a cardboard sign telling you what they need, but the needs are still there. Maybe you need a friend to be there when you're struggling at work. 
or, or you need a friend to be there when you're struggling in your marriage. You need a shoulder to cry on when we're admitting our parenting struggles and we feel like we're failing our kids. Maybe we need someone to pray for us or just have coffee with us as we process losing our friends or our parents or to death and disease. There's all kinds of poverty in the world. And sometimes a poverty of the soul is harder to spot. And so I know Byron Center may not have as much you know, obvious need with people on the street corners, but I promise you the need to be satisfied, it exists in all places, no matter how much money people have in the bank account. We need to stay hungry for the cross by number one, finding satisfaction in God and God alone. And number two, by loving our neighbor. You are what you eat from your head to your feet. So let's make sure as Christians, we're not dieting on distractions, but that we are hungry for holiness. Let's pray.